Divine Truth Assistance Group. Group assistance sessions putting principles of divine truth into action. This recording is from the Developing My Loving Self group and is part of an Education in Love series. In the introduction presentation, Jesus introduces the Developing My Loving Self assistance group from the Education in Love series, conducts a brief revision of what has been taught thus far, and presents a summary of the coming week. Recorded on the 4th of June, 2016, in New Seville, Queensland, Australia. Morning, how are you? Morning. Good. Uh, how are those who were in tents? How are you going? Good. Good. Dry? Is it fizzy? Yeah. There's only 100 mil instead of 200. <laughs> or 40, is it? Yeah. yeah. So that's good. At least it wasn't a big storm that you totally <laughs> ruined all of your <laughs> tents on the first day. Yeah. And before I start, I'd just like to give you my apologies because I'm actually not that well. So um, the reason why is a few days ago I started dealing with some fears that uh, I need to deal with and uh, I'm a bit resistive to it. So, so I've got a fever and a sore throat. So, so that's how I feel today. Hopefully it still lasts the day. <laughs> if not, then I'll just counsel. <laughs> no. no, I should be right. I, I feel a bit better than I felt the last few days, so, so it's good. All right. Full room, huh? Mm. The last group was 50, as Mary's probably already pointed out to you. And we had a we had a great time actually, a really good time, and uh, had a had a great uh, the whole whole week was very good. I think a lot of the people who've been there, some of them are your partners or whatever, and they've probably come home all <laughs> raring to go. Did they give away all their secrets? Or <laughs> for those of you, yeah, they did. <laughs> 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 Couldn't help it, could they? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I feel you, you'll enjoy the next six days, eight days really, with a couple of days break. And, uh, and I, I certainly enjoyed preparing the material, although, as Mary's probably already explained as well, we uh, had a three or four edits of it first to get it right. How about we think we've got a right, nice balance? The only issue we have, though, is there's so much material. There's just so much material. And as a result of that, I'm not going to be able to cover everything that's in your outlines. And that's so, but when it comes to the Q&As, you have the ability to question the things I have not covered from the main talk in, in the Q&As as well. So take that opportunity to do that with those Q&As that you have. Yeah. <laughs> it's good to see your smiling faces. Mine too. <laughs> Did you miss me? <laughs> yeah. So we come to the actual presentation proper, developing my loving self. And this is just the introduction. We'll have 40 minutes as an introduction on the material. And, uh, and what I'd like to do probably first is to introduce you to a concept in this series of groups that we haven't used so far in the other groups because we want to sort of give you some ideas about what's loving and what's not loving. And you'll see at the top of every outline, you'll see there's a, the love-based viewpoint, and then there's the unloving viewpoint of the same thing in many cases. And I want to explain to you why we've done that uh, as a part of the introduction. So remember that we're here because we want to be educated by God about love. That's our purpose for being here. Now, now, I can't give you the education that God can give you, but I can help you connect to God so that God can give you the education. Right? So any person who's connected to God already can educate you about how to connect to God, and then those particular people can step back and let God do the education of you. Now, for, for the majority of us, 
Well, and I'd say pretty much for everyone present, you've not yet connected to God. So we want to talk about why and we want to discover the real reason why. And, that, and that's why we're raising this issue of developing my loving self. Remember in the first group, we were referring to the will and how important the will is. And we'll revise a bit of the first group in a minute. But in this group, we're now focusing on how are we using that will in terms of the development of ourselves. So that's what we're focusing on now. But before we do that, we want to talk about this concept of love versus the opposite of love. Right? Now, for the sake, this is just an acronym that's been developed. We were having a discussion with a group of people and we were flying, you know, floating things around because I, I wanted to come up with some kind of a word. I really wanted it to be one syllable though, but anyway. <laughs> um, I wanted to come up with a word that in one syllable describes um, the opposite of love while at the same time making sense to you. The trouble is that I couldn't come up with one in one syllable. So, <laughs> so we came up with evil, the opposite of love, like love all switched around, right? Did you notice that? Clever. Not many of you noticed that. <laughs> yeah, a few of you did, but not many. So, yeah, it's love all switched around. It's the L-O-V-E, but the opposite way around. So what we want to do, this is the erroneous. version of love. Now, throughout a, a really important part of the outlines we've given you is the actual difference between what God's trying to teach you with regard to love and what the world has taught you already with regard to love. And so every time during this discussion that we have, we, I, I many times refer to evil. So you now know what it means. It's the world version, if you like, the version we've been taught to have of love compared to what God's version of love actually is. Now, you'll notice in every outline that's there, in every outline right at the beginning, and also a little summary right at the end it refers to that as well, the proper view of love. Uh, but I will not be raising any of those issues with you during these presentations because we just do not have time. In fact, we could spend hours and hours just discussing each little one thing or one point of learning of the proper view of love compared to the erroneous version of love. So, so the reality is every single one of these one-hour presentations could easily be a 30-hour presentation. And, and so, of course, we're not going to be able to present to you everything about it. And for many of you, you're going to actually find that you think you understand it on the day that you hear it. And then 10 years later, you realise, oh, I didn't understand it then and I'm starting to now. You know, that, that's how it's going to be. And that's the same with all soul-based learning. It's like that. So I want to introduce that particular process, or that particular thing that we've done now in all of, the, all of these presentations and and it's likely that we'll also do it in future presentations when it's applicable to the material where we can contrast the love versus evil and what the world's view of love is compared to what God's view of love is because remember we're here to discover what God's view of love is now of course for many of us we're not going to know that we're going to think we know it but we're not going to know it until God tells us so the key is going to be being open to the fact that God can tell us what God's version of love is first. But, but we need to first be open to God before we can hear what God's saying to us from a soul perspective. The other problem that, I, that we have in the group, and, and you'll notice this a lot during this group perhaps, and that is the way in which we communicate, and I've gone through this before, but I just want to revise this with you. The way I communicate with you is very, very different to the way you communicate with me. And I want to just sort of outline the different forms of communication that we have, because, because it's going to take some time for you to understand this when we interact. For most of us, we have a feeling. Let's say the feeling begins down there, you know, you know the you know, stomach-based intuition that we sometimes talk about, but it could be anywhere. But I'll just say it, we have a feeling, 
So we feel something. That generates a thought. And then that has to be turned into a language that gets transmitted. And unfortunately, you know, some of us are not, some of us are from other countries, so, you know, it's not even our first language that I'm transmitting these thoughts into. And of course, my understanding of the English language is rudimentary as well, so that, that doesn't help. So it trans transmits into language, which then is heard, right? It's heard by the hearer. And so this obviously should come out of our mouth probably, so we just put a, so it comes out of our mouth there, heard by the hearer. That's translated into a thought, which is then translated into feelings. Right? Now the only problem with all of that is it can see that it's not very accurate. So what I say and what you feel as a result of what I say is often very different to what I feel about what I'm saying. Right? Now the way I communicate with you is I feel your feeling straight through to my feelings. So very frequently my assessment of your feelings is much more accurate than your own. And later, as you develop, you'll find you'll develop exactly the same trait or quality and you'll find you'll be doing that with everyone. You'll actually feel what they feel. All celestial spirits communicate that way and God communicates that way. Now the only problem is, if I'm communicating in this way, feeling, thought, language, thought, and to get to the to another person, and God's communicating this way, feeling to feeling. Can you see that God skips over all the crap that we generate in our thoughts and, and, and through language, and he actually feels exactly what you are, what you really feel right now. And God wants you to be able to feel God in exactly the same way. And in fact, that's how God is going to transfer God's truth to you. God's education comes through you being able to feel God's truth rather than you having to think about or analyse what it is. God can tell you through his feelings what the truth actually is. The key for you is to be open enough for that to occur, to be open enough emotionally for that to occur. Now, in the Q&A sessions that we have, this is what I'm going to do with you. I'm going to feel what you feel, and you're going to think that what I'm talking about doesn't apply to you because you've already gone through a whole lot of extra steps thinking and, and not properly translating your own feelings, even to yourself. Right? And sometime in your future, when you actually have the same ability, you will realise I was telling you the truth. <laughs> Because right now, for many of you, you don't even feel that I am, that I can do that. Does that make sense? Yep, if we, Amber? Um, does it feel unpleasant for you connecting to someone else's feelings and feeling what they feel? Like, is it an energetic thing that gets transferred and doesn't feel good? Well, see, that depends on my injuries, doesn't it? If I have an injury, say you're projecting at me that I'm not any good, right? Which happens frequently. A lot of people feel I'm not very good. And um, if I have issues of worth associated with myself, then your projections of me that I'm not very good will have a resonance in me. And therefore, I will feel bad about that particular thing. Does that make sense? But if you're projecting at me something completely different that has nothing to do with me, and, and only a feeling that you have that I've already gone through and felt, then I can feel your feeling very accurately without actually having any side effect, if you like, yeah. of my own feelings as a result. Yeah? Make sense? Graham, if you want to... Um, if we're talking about, say, we have a celestial guide mm -hmm. and the celestial guide is talking to us, they have a choice of talking to us through language or feelings, do they? They do, but, but they would prefer feelings. Well, they, the way they hear from you is always your feelings. 
So they don't, you, you might be saying things to them that they know is just a whole heap of crap, you know, they, they know it's all false because they can actually feel what's going on inside of you. What they get to say in return very much depends upon your emotions and how your emotions get triggered, even by their thoughts. So they know that the bigger the, bigger the limitation of the held on emotions that you have inside of you, the bigger their limitations are to communicate truth with you. Right? And for, it's the same for God as well. It's the limit we're placing on God, one of the limitations we're placing on God. So <clears throat> is there a difference in my experience if I'm receiving something from a guide as compared to receiving something from God? Um, there is Well, every celestial spirit um, communicates, usually it prefers communication in this manner, so the same way that God communicates. So there will be a difference in scale, in scope, and in the amount of truth, but in the end, whatever the celestial spirit communicates to you will be at least a subset of what God can do. So there's not a fundamental difference in sort of flavour? Sort not, of not really, no. For many of you, though, what's happening is spirits who are unloving are communicating to you and feeding your addictions. Now, for many of you, you feel that's God or you feel that's a friendly spirit because the, the friendly spirit is giving you what you want. So you then interpret that as someone who's nice. And this is part of our evil, part of our erroneous version of love. Interpreting something as nice and it actually being nice are two completely different things. And we're going to interpret things as nice. And this is the problem we face during these conversations that we're going to have about a, a lot of stuff we've talked about before, but perhaps not in the same way. But we're going to struggle because there are going to be times when I'm talking to you about what you actually feel when you're talking to me about what you think you feel, which is often very, very different. Does that make sense? If I can move on, because there's a lot to cover, is that all right? Yeah. I just wanted to bring that up because when we come to discussing a lot of the points we'll be discussing today, and also over the next six days, uh, over the next eight, six days of presentations, there are going to be times when you feel that I'm saying something completely different than what I am actually feeling. And, and if you have those moments, then clarify them as much as you possibly can. I'm going to keep on time, though, as much as I possibly can. There's a lot of material to cover, so I'll proceed with that. Well, let's come now to uh, a revision, shall we, of what we've gone through up to now. Remember in the first session, which uh, all of you should have had a chance to at least view, even though you have not had a chance to put it into practice, probably, because we haven't had much time, if we go through the main things that we learned in the first session, remember we first needed to analyse our attitude towards love and change. That's what the group wanted us to do, to analyse our personal attitude. And in that process we generally found that we had a whole lot of definitions of love which were completely different or obviously completely different to God's definitions of love. And in fact many of our, even our definitions of God were like God is a parent really. And we, we could see the connection between God being a parent and, and the fact that we need to disconnect ourselves from that concept because uh, earthly parents and God are very, very different from each other. We also examined the issue of change and how afraid we are of it. And, we, and often we, we're not only just afraid, we're terrified. You know, we're like, it always reminds me of my father when he used to go shooting rabbits, you know. And, and for most of us, we're like the rabbit. And in the case where my father shot rabbits, what he would do is rather than shooting a rabbit with a bullet, because that would mark the rabbit and, and also mean the bullet had to be dug out of the flesh, you know, and these were for eating, what he used to do was shoot above the rabbit and the sound barrier of the bullet would crack so loudly that the rabbit would, for, a, for around 10 to 20 seconds, would just freeze, completely freeze. And then they used to walk up, pick them up, and wring their neck. That's how they wouldn't even walk away. They wouldn't run away. And this is how we are uh, inside of ourselves a lot of times. We're just terrified of all sorts of things. And we'll look at, we'll look at this issue of terror later in this group. But it, going back to our first group, we need to use our will to see how terrified we are. We need to see that. 
And then that driving how we become unloving, you know, using our will to become unloving. And in that process, we learnt one primary fact, and that is we are choosing to be unloving. For many of us, we are choosing to be unloving thinking that what we're choosing is actually love. In other words, our definition of love is you do this. So, for example, in a relationship, our definition of love is if they need something, if they're afraid, then you make their fear go away. That's our definition of love. So we do whatever we can to make their fear go away. That's our definition of love. And yet, from God's point of view, that is actually a sin. That is out of harmony with God's laws of love. So we can see from the first group that we have a confusion about what love is. Can you see that? And what the truth is. We have confusion about that too. And then we went on to uh, facing our resistance in the first group, facing our resistance to love and change. And remember, that was all about facing our resistance to four primary qualities. You remember what those qualities were? You yell them out and I'll write them up. So faith, truth, truth action and emotion. Good. Now, now, if you look at the issue of emotion, really what we're talking about here is being humble, isn't it? Humility. Feeling the real emotion, not something that's been manufactured, but something that's real inside of us. Okay, so we found that we found in the first group that we were very resistive to these things. Remember, very resistant to developing faith, because if you develop faith, that motivates your action. A lot of times we don't want to act, so, so what do we do? We resist faith. And, and then with truth, most of us still have a deep fear of truth, particularly truth associated with self, personal truth, a deep fear of it. And then, of course, we have a deep fear of action as well because we're worried that, you know, do we, are we doing the right thing? Are we doing the wrong thing? What's right? What's wrong? I don't really know. Perhaps the best cause of action is to do nothing, but then that's a sin as well, so what do I do? And so a lot of times we are just stuck in a place of inactivity for long periods of time, avoiding action. And then when we came to this section of emotion, we could see how resistive we are to feeling emotion. We're really quite shut down to our emotional condition. Now, can you see from my previous diagram that I drew on the board, being shut down to your emotional condition is going to be a major problem if you're going to communicate with God, because that's how God communicates. So to shut down in that area is going to cause you to have no ability to receive an education from God. Right? Now that is a big problem and it's very interesting that every person generally who leaves listening to divine truth always goes away saying feelings not the answer and it's very interesting that that happens because there's the indication that there's the main problem that we have on the planet when I, I'm saying to you communication with God is soul to soul feeling to feeling and then every person who leaves listening to divine truth goes no it's not feelings it's other things all I've got to do is long for God's love. But they don't even see love as a feeling. Interesting. Like, so already some major flaws in understanding that most people have, even those that have listened to truth for years. And why don't they want to believe that that's the way God communicates? Because they don't want to be humble. They don't want to feel. Very important, those four points. So, so we learnt those four qualities. Now, we're going to be talking about those four qualities quite a lot in this group because they are tools that you're going to be able to use to develop your loving self. They are the tools you're going to be needing. So when we examined this material, then we went to the final couple of days of our first group, and that was all about how we're using our will. Are we using our will through a force of our mind in other words, willpower, or are we using our will, seeing that actually our soul-based feelings are actually often very opposite to what our mind is telling us is good. And so what we try to do is we try to suppress our real soul-based feelings and try to do what's good. And it doesn't work very well because we always get drawn back into the feelings driving our behaviour when we're in situations, particularly in situations that are like pressure cooker situations. 
situations that, that trigger us before we've caught ourselves with our willpower, we're already engaged using our will unlovingly. Big problem. So we identified the need for us to develop the ability to, re to release from ourselves the, and, and identify and release from ourselves the underlying driving force of our unloving behaviour, which is actually our will, right, used in an unloving manner. That's the underlying driving force, the justification of our will being used in an unloving manner. And, that, and you could think of that as your engine. That's the engine that's driving your vehicle, your whole per being, your, per your soul along with the two bodies. The engine driving it is this will that you actually have inside of yourself developed. And there's a lot of reasons why it's developed in an unloving way some of which we'll find in the next few uh, uh, discussions we have today. But you can see that these qualities are going to be very necessary now when it comes to developing your loving self as a, as a necessary part of your development. So that brings us to what are we going to talk about with you this week. And this is what we're going to do. The first thing we want to do, we're going to, break, we're going to break the week up into three sessions of two days apiece. And you'll see at the top of every outline, you've basically got the session it relates to. But, but the first session is the session about understanding. What makes us unloving? And so you could say that a different way, couldn't you? Understanding my unloving self. Uh, we need to come to understand what, what is actually going on inside of us that, you know, that we're constantly trying to ignore it and, and I hope it goes away and use our willpower to change it. But what, what is really happening inside of me? Like, we need to have less confusion about that so we understand what's really happening inside of us. And in this uh, area, we're going to be uh, raising three issues with you. The first one is what creates our pain? What then creates our facade? And actually, how do we go about accepting that we've created this facade? Because that's about accepting and understanding who we really are. And we need to come to the point of accepting and understanding who we really are right at the moment, which to a large degree is a lot of unloving behaviour, even though many of us are believing, no, I'm, I'm trying to be loving. Every day I try to be loving. But the reality is the unloving behaviour comes from two primary areas. One, my false definitions of love. In other words, what I think love is, is what I'm doing. But what I think love is, is often what God's view is completely opposite to. Right? And then the other thing is, uh, how am I using my will to just knee-jerk reaction, present a different person that I feel myself to be to the world in order to maintain a lot of my fears, which we'll talk about in our group. So we need to understand what makes, me, what makes my unloving self. Then we need to go through the process of releasing my a loving self. What what steps what steps are involved in that process? We need to know, don't we? What are what are the steps I need to take in the process of releasing my loving self? If we come to Ivana down the front, thanks, Amber. <coughs> Um, I guess you'd have to first see that you're being unloving and then feel. Well, that's feel. about this part, seeing. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Releasing. Uh, yeah. Feeling the unloving emotions like, and letting them go. Yeah, there must be a process we need to go through, isn't there, to do that, right? And, and that's what we're going to discuss in a bit more detail. So we'll <coughs> spend some time on that. How, how to actually release your unloving self. And, and the fact in that area we'll actually learn that there are some emotions that affect lots and lots of the areas of your unloving self. And then there are some emotions that only affect little pieces of your unloving self. And obviously it's more powerful to release the big, 
the emotion that affects most things than it is to be just releasing the ones that affect little things. So we'll talk about governing emotions, deconstructing this facade that we've now built, and also what it means to actually release pain. How do we go about the process of releasing pain? Now in the first group, when it got to releasing pain, this day, the, the third day, was the most difficult. And the fourth day, we started discussing releasing pain, and the majority of people, when I had the discussion with them, when we got to the Q&A, every single Q&A wasn't about the subject. <laughs> we, and I had to say, no, that one's not about it, that one's not about it, that one's not about it. And we went through the entire hour saying that none of the questions are about <laughs> the, the subject. And we'll talk about why it is that the majority of us are asking questions that are not pertaining to subjects. Some subjects are subjects where we're not there yet, and therefore we have no, no idea what to ask. And we think we're asking about them, but really we're asking about other things. Right. And then we get to the uh, third part of this group, and honestly, the third part of this group, we could spend months on. Right. So it's a very rudimentary uh, introduction to the material in the third part of the group. And the third part of the group is all about how to become Becoming my loving self. And in that area, we're going to focus your attention on what is my real self. Uh, what, how, how to identify my real self. What gifts God has given me to develop into a loving person. What things I need to do, what, what will-based choices I'm going to need to engage to develop myself into a loving person. And how do I be loving how do i just be live live in this state of being loving not in my day-to-day -day life and also in the world that we live in that that you have to agree is often quite the opposite right so so that's what we were discussing in that third section now when it came to the third section everyone in the first group sort of enlivened up again i suppose you could say because there's so many fascinating s subjects in there that we could cover, but un unfortunately we're, not, we're going to have very little time to discuss them. So this is why we feel you're going to need additional question time and to send in some questions and we discuss more questions. So we feel that what we're going to probably finish up doing is having another four hours of Q&A via the FAQ channel or via the FAQ at divinetruth.com email address. Uh, where we actually address many of the questions that we couldn't address in, in, these, in these sections. But this is one reason why you're going to need to be very specific with your questions. This, and, and this, and also all subsequent groups, are quite information heavy. And so you're not going to get a chance. And sometimes you're going to wish, you were, I want to pause now, can you just stop now so I can <laughs> just... And, you know, it's like, you know, when, at least when you're watching me on the video, you can go, pause, pause, pause. What did you say? <laughs> like, and, and the problem is that pretty much most of the things, most of the sentences that are said, you're probably going to need to pause. And, and I'm not going to pause. I'm just going to keep going. So, so that's going to be a bit difficult in terms of your absorption of information. And, and so what I suggest to you is to go back over the material again when you get home. You get the chance to go over the first group's material as well. And that will help you open up to what's actually being said. So that's our week ahead. Now, the reason why we're doing this is very important as well, isn't it? We need to understand the reason why we're discover discussing things in this way. Well, the primary reasons why are, I think, fairly obvious if you analyse what needs to happen. We need to get to the stage, and now remember, we'd, so this is the reasons. Here I am, here God is, right? I need to be able to communicate to God. I need to be able to receive communication from God in order to be educated from God. And what did we say in the previous diagram? God reads our feelings, and God transmits his feelings. Now God's capable of transmitting to you every single feeling God has about a certain thing. So for example, 
You might be engaged uh, treating your partner unlovingly, for example. You're able to connect to God and find out what God feels about you doing that. And God will transmit the actual feeling to you of what he feels about it. And so some of the feelings are going to be powerfully, like for you, you're going to feel powerfully like p sad and ashamed and all sorts of feelings like that that God can transmit to you about what he feels about those particular things that, are, that you're actually engaging in. But you can see that if, if I want to be educated by God, I'm going to have to have some openness to God's feelings. So it gets back down to one primary truth that we need to contemplate, and that is this. God wants to have a relationship with me. And it's only me, by the use of my will, that can prevent that relationship. And in particular, it's by using my will to detune from my feelings that causes me to prevent that relationship. So obviously, if, if we looked at the first group, we're talking about development of the will, and now we're looking at, okay, we've got to have a look at what we're doing, what's going on inside of me that causes me to prevent this relationship. Because without receiving this, relation, without receiving this information from God, I can't be educated by God. And if I can't be educated by God, then I'm reliant on other people to tell me things. Now, this is very dangerous to become reliant on persons to tell you things because in the end, those persons will have their own ideas and own concepts of what love is and their own ideas and own concepts of what truth is. And they will freely usually share those concepts and ideas with you. They'll have no trouble doing that. And the problem is you've got nothing to compare that with. There's no yardstick to compare what's being said to you with what is actually the truth. And no yardstick in particular to compare what people are transmitting to you as feelings and comparing it to God's feelings on the same matter. So there's got to be a way that we can develop some kind of things inside of ourselves that where our will is no longer used to... See, at the moment our will is used to basically block feelings, to block the transmission, the transmission of and the reception of feelings. And there's got to be some things that we can do to firstly understand that that's what's going on and why is that going on. What, what, what caused this to happen? What, what's the truth about what triggered this or caused this to occur? And, and then how do I go about addressing that? How do I go about undoing that? Because if I don't undo it, I have no chance to be educated by God. And then I am left foundering around, being driven, as one Bible verse says, driven by the waves of the sea. One person drives me this way and I go that way. And one person drives me this way and I go that way. Some spirits drive me this way and I go that way. And so forth. And that's what happens. I'm just back forward being driven around rather than actually connecting. Chris, you would like to ask? Thanks, Wayne. Hi. Um, I don't know if this is what you're going to cover later, but mm -hmm. how can I be with myself to allow to allow everything if i've got blockages to god how can i be with myself to allow the recognition of the blockages and so on and so on well that's why we're doing it this way we we, we need to understand first what's being constructed inside of ourselves and then we need to go through the process of deconstructing that like pulling it apart because because only we can do that Nobody can do that for us. Remember, every construction that we have constructed or somebody else has constructed inside of us that we have chosen to hold on to has to be deconstructed by ourselves because, because God can't reach in and grab something from us unless our will is engaged. Uh, and for the majority of us, our will is engaged going, no, no, don't do that, don't do that. Don't. And we're basically saying to God, don't reach in and take away these things that are my 
beliefs about myself and who I think I am and who, you know, don't, don't tell me that my definitions of love are wrong and don't tell me that my definitions of truth are wrong. So we're going, no, no, no to God. We're rejecting the God's operation, if you like, of helping us to deconstruct what's inside. And as a result of that being the exercise of our will, nothing is going to get deconstructed. And we don't want to use our willpower because all that is is using our head to overcome what we're already doing. And every, you know, Christians have tried that for t thousands of years. It doesn't work, right? It's, and this is what we need to give up as well. So, so we need to go through the actual program before you'll probably see how to go about the process. And it is, to a degree, quite simple to understand, but requires quite a lot of. Um, a pro uh, it requires a process for you to go through. Firstly, you need to come to understand what's going on. Then you need to accept that that's what's going on. And then you need to go through the process of deconstructing what's going on before you can really let go of the big castle that you've created, preventing God from having an influence on you. Does that make sense? So we're going to cover all of those things, Chris, through the group. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Phones off, please. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> we forget. Okay, so, so this is why, and the reason why we need to do that is quite clear, isn't it? The reason why we need to do that is because we need to do whatever we need to do to allow God to communicate with us. Now, if you examine history, there's very few people who even claim to have a communication pathway with God. And then of those people who claim to, most of them are totally bat bonkers, <laughs> aren't they? Like they do, they say, oh, God told me to go and murder this person, so off I went with a machine gun and polished them off. And you go, what? Do you think a loving God would tell you that? Of course I do, you know? You know, most of them are crazy with the way that they get influenced by so-called God. Now, obviously, you know, there needs to be a way for us to tell as well as to what's getting communicated to us, meant to measure what's actually happening. So these are all parts of things we need to know. So that's why we're going through this program with you over the coming six days. And we're going to enjoy sharing this information with you. Uh, it's information that we've had to engage personally, so that's why we're sharing it with you. It's, informa it's information that if you want to be able to be educated by God, you're going to have to engage. And the reason why I say have to is quite clear. God has a way of communicating with mankind, with humankind. It is only one way. There's no second, third, fourth, 25, 1,000 options of communication with God. There is one way. When you think about it, if you think about of all, all of God's laws, so for example, the, some of the laws you do understand, like the law of gravity. There is one law of gravity. The size of the mass determines the gravitational field. It's consistent, it can be measured, it is measurable and also mathematically explainable. Is it not? The law of aerodynamics, another law that you engage. right? It is mathematically explainable. There is only one way to engage it. There has to be enough thrust and a rough lift in order to create the lift required to overcome the law of gravity. And it's calculatable and predictable based on the atmosphere and the atmospheric pressure and a number of other factors. It's all predictable. It's all mathematically defined. And what I'm suggesting to you is the way that God communicates with you is already mathematically defined. It's a law. And just like all the other laws, it can be defined and engaged, like every other law. That's what I'm suggesting to you. God is consistent every single time with the way in which God communicates. Now that's an interesting fact, isn't it, if you think about it? If we view it that way, we examine all the other laws, they're all to the point, direct. There is a truth that we can define mathematically. Then surely, if God is the same consistent being who made those laws that define the operation of our day-to-day -day life, then God would also be consistent in the way that God defined the law that enables you and God to have a relationship. 
Now those laws are called the laws of divine love. You'll learn about them in our next group, actually, some of those laws, and, and how they define everything. But what I'm suggesting to you is if there is a law, then all I've got to do is find out where I'm breaking it. Is that not true? If there's a law that defines communication between me and God, all I've got to do is work out how I'm not engaging that law, and then basically I'll be able to engage the communication. Just like, you know, if I jump off a building, I break my leg. Law of gravity in action, right? There must be reasons for my not being able to have a communication we've got now that are defined by the law. Isn't that the case? And if that's the case, then, then you can see that if I'm going to develop my loving self to enable the law, to engage this law, whatever these laws are, I'm going to need to obviously work out how this law works between God's transmission of God's feelings to me and my transmission of my feelings to God. I'm going to have to understand. Now to do that, I'm going to have to understand what stopped me from doing it as well. I'm going to have to understand what blocks me from automatically engaging that law. You see, the law of gravity, I'm automatically engaging. I didn't even have to understand it, did I? Like, I walk out the door, I don't fly off into space. The building we're in doesn't fly off into space. We're spinning at, you know, what is it? So, a thousand more kilometres an hour. And, and the centrifugal force would normally, if there was no gravity, I'd be off in a moment, right? But I don't, because I'm engaging the law. But see, with some laws, there's an automatic engagement, and other laws, there's a purposeful engagement required, an understanding. And what we need to do is develop some understanding about ourselves to see what's stopping our engagement of the law. Does that make sense? Havana, you'd like to ask? Um, I was just wondering, with children, um, feeling their feelings uh, more than what us adults do, mm -hmm. does that mean they automatically sort of are having a relationship with God? Mm, well, they potentially can, if they oh. knew of God. Okay, so it would depend on their parents. Depending and on their, their will, wouldn't it? The oh. child's will. So even if the children's parents have no belief in God, yep. can the child still have a... Uh, like a will to connect yeah, to God. Yeah, certainly. And, the chi and children, as we'll talk about in a minute in, in one of our next presentations, you have a natural desire to actually feel, don't they? Yeah. So, so this, des this tells us that God actually designed us to communicate with God in the right way and what we've done, society, humankind in their sin has done, is suppress the right way and choose, try to choose other ways. Right, so actually what we're trying to do is look at what humans have created in order to avoid the thing that God created. That's what we'll be doing in the group, obviously. Make sense? Yep, thank yeah, thank you. So you can see it's quite clear that humans have obviously created this whole other ways that we operate with each other. As I said in our, my previous diagram, remember the diagram where I talked about the two people? and how they communicate. That's how humans communicate. But we've even, we've even worsened that situation. We go, this is what we do. So here we are, we've got communication between two people. Remember that it starts with a feeling, and then it goes to a thought. And what do we do in that process? We go, hang on a sec, this feeling doesn't feel very good. If I say this feeling, people will do this to me, they'll judge me, they'll attack me, they might, they might punish me, they might think I'm nuts, they'll be condescending to me, they'll do all these unpleasant things. So what do I do? I have the thought, oh, that's a reflection of the feeling initially, but then I go, hang on a sec, I need to modify this, this thought and transmit it into a language that the other person is not going to, in other words, transmit into a language that controls the other person's response to my feelings. 
So it's not only complicated in the sense that there's a few steps that have to occur, but it's also complicated because our will is already now engaged trying to modify our way that we communicate. We're trying to go, we, we, we judge the emotion that's already occurred within us. We think about that emotion and we go, oh, it's not very nice, you know. I really feel like killing that person, but that's not very nice. So I'll just say, have a nice day. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm not suggesting that you need to act upon killing a person, but what I'm suggesting is that we often do not say what we feel. Is that not true? <coughs> Frequently that's the case. Now, now that's an added complexity in this whole problem, isn't it? So I'm feeling something, I think something, but I won't say it because I've got a whole heap of other things going on inside of me that says, don't say that, you're not allowed to say that, you get judged for saying that, you'll be condemned for saying that, you'll be condemned for saying what you feel. And as a result, I modify it. And then this person goes, I'm really confused. You feel angry to me, but you say, have a nice day. Can you understand why it's so confusing? Of course it's confusing, right? And this is what we need to deconstruct. We need to deconstruct. What, why do we do this? Why do we engage in this way? What, what's going on in this area in our loving selves that causes me to be something different to what I am? And then looking at what I really am, oftentimes it's not that good. What can I do about that? How do I go about deconstructing that? That's what I need to focus my attention on. So what we're going to do over the next uh, six days is focus you on these things. You know, focus you on what we're going to be doing in, the, in, these, in this regard. And remember, our primary desire here is to help you be able to express, not, not only just express your feelings, because many of your current feelings are unloving. We have to admit that, right? So, so not only just to express your feelings, but eventually we want to work down to how do I get, how do I firstly understand why I feel this way? Secondly, what can I do to remove why I feel this way? And thirdly, what can I do to actually have the feelings that I think I want to have? <laughs> right. What can I do to develop my loving, the loving, my loving self? And these are the things that we would like to focus our attention on with you in the coming week. Sound good? Yep. Mm. So, so you can see that this side of the board now, you can see there's a whole diagram here. And what we want to do is spend some time over, by the end of this week, you'll understand a fair portion of this diagram. You'll understand what the motivations are, what the will-based decisions are, what's really going on. And not only that, hopefully by the end you'll understand some of the will-based choices and decisions you're going to need to make in order to deconstruct it, what you're going to need to do to deconstruct the whole process. Many of you at the moment have a severe amount of judgment about these things inside of you. <coughs> and, and we need to address this judgment. This judgment stops you from actually progressing. And we'll talk about that today, later today. So we're going to look at how we became our unloving selves. And I'm not suggesting that we're all unloving, in the sense of like all of my being is unloving, because that's not normally the case. Normally there's some bits of love. Even in the most evil person, sometimes they do some good things. They do. Right? But... For the majority of us, our definition of love is what's flawed. And so we believe we're doing what is loving when actually we are being unloving. And this is a major problem for us because it means that we're actually, for many of us, in denial of what is going on. We're running around madly trying to do things that we think are loving, that we believe in our mind are loving, are loving but the reality is God's, God's viewpoint is that they're not. And so God's laws operate upon what's God's, it's God's universe, God's laws. God's laws operate upon what's really going on. And by the way, God's laws don't operate on what you do. They operate on what you feel.
So this is why in the first century I said even a man looking at another woman and wanting to have sex with her in his heart is already committing adultery in his heart. God's laws judge what the person wants to do, not what the person is doing. Which is very, very different from man's laws, right? Man's laws say you can think whatever you want as long as you don't do whatever we think is wrong. <laughs> and God's laws are not like that. So what we need to do is learn a lot about law, which of course is our next group. You know, There's a whole series of things we need to learn about law. But in this group, what we want to do is focus on our attention on what the feelings are inside of us and why they're there. Because if we understand the feelings and why they're there, we will be able to do something about it. That's the purpose. All right, well, let's uh, have a break now for 10 minutes. If we come back at 11.30, and uh, we'll get started on the proper part of the material. <laughs>